It's great to be back to some degree of normality. Um, okay, so uh, there's a bit too many, few too many slides here, so it's going to be a little bit fast. But you know, if you want to slow me down, just ask questions, and yeah, I'll, I will stop and answer. Um, so this is ongoing work with uh, Peter Sonberg uh, here in Prague, in Carleen, in the Charles University, um, and it's part of the ongoing program, I guess, that we have to understand the non-commutative geometry of quantum groups. So let's start off with a good old-fashioned crowd pleaser, something that will make everybody happy, the gelfand nymark theorem. So we have a duality, just like Tristan was talking about two, three weeks ago when he was discussing dualities. This is the mother and father of them all. Uh, we have a duality of categories between compact house door spaces uh, and morphisms being continuous maps and commutative C star algebras together with star home morphisms. And then, of course, in the non-commutative setting, when we look at... Mm -hmm. It should be unital. Ah, okay, sure, 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 okay. Um, in the non-commutative setting, when we then look at non-commutative Caesar algebras, of course, we think about these as sort of non-commutative topologies, and we try to take a lot of the classical results in topology, try to turn them into something Caesar algebraic, and then generalize it and continue, consider it a non-commutative analog of the classical thing. Okay. That's our job. That's what we do. Um, now, of course, there are topological spaces that have more structure than just a group, sorry, than just a topological space. One of the best, for example, in my opinion, is topological groups. And here, you can build upon Gelfand Neumark, that's what Voronovich did, to find an equivalent formulation, a dual formulation of a compact topological group, namely a commutative uh, compact quantum group. Okay. So you've basically taken the group structure on the left-hand side and you've turned it into what's called a co-product on the right-hand side. And it turns out that this is going to be a duality as well. Okay. Very successful, very simple definition uh, given by Voronovich back in the 80s with profound consequences. Many good examples, very large family of good examples, a really good definition building on um, Gelfa Neimark. Now, there were also uh, topological spaces that admit a smooth structure, we call them smooth manifolds. And this is ongoing work of Kahn, from, I guess, from the 80s as well, even before, trying to see if you can build upon Gelfand Neumark to produce uh, non-commutative, Caesar algebraic uh, formulation of the notion of a manifold, of a smooth manifold. And uh, this was eventually finished, I don't know, is it 10 years ago at this stage? Something like this. Uh, to give for this famous reconstruction theorem. So he doesn't just have a manifold, he puts in a bit more. He puts in that we have a Romanian metric. He also puts in that it's spin, which is Paul Bohm always says, it's a complicated definition, but really it's just orientability of the manifold plus a little bit extra. This classic line, and I guess it's a good one. And then he showed that they're equivalent to this object called a spectral triple. So it composes of, of three things, which is, makes sense since it's a triple. One is an algebra. The algebra here should be a pre c star algebra. Something star algebra is going to be dense inside in a c star algebra. Uh, then you've got a, a Hilbert space upon which this algebra is represented, star representation of bounded operators. And then you've got an operator D, which is operating on the Hilbert space, densely defined, unbounded operator in the style of the Freddy's talks at the Mali seminar at the, I guess, over the summer, more or less. And they all have to interact. These three pieces of information have to act in a certain way. That is just, I guess, the topological part, because you can get one of these for any commutative c star algebra. Um, so there's nothing really differential going on there. And what it is, in effect, is an unbounded representative of the k-homology group of the c star algebra. So then this dot, dot, dot that you have extra, the so-called higher axioms, the ones that are there to capture the fact that over here, we don't just have a topological space, we have extra, we have this differential structure. Now, the differential, the definition of a differential manifold classically is actually quite complicated. It's significantly more complicated than the definition of a topological space, for example, or a topological group. I mean, it's built upon the definition of a topological space, of course. So this definition in the non-commutative setting is uh, analogously complicated, not completely intuitive, and it's not clear I would say that's a reasonable thing to say, that it's not clear that this is, it's reached its final form or that we really know what this thing should be. It's not to say anything for a lot of the, the very good work that's been done by people on this, but it's still early days. So 
the contention of this talk, in general of what, what we do, is that this needs to be motivated by, in the non-commutative setting, just removing commutativity here, it needs to be motivated by a large class of interesting commutative examples. And that should, that is going to be key to actually finding final correct form of this. And that's what this talk is going to be about today. And we're going to try to find them in quantum groups. So all of this is just background. We're not really going to be using so much of this anymore, but it's, uh, it's good to keep this in mind. That's basically the setting that we're working in this, this larger setting. But most of what's going to be going on here today is going to be algebraic. Okay, so what are these class of examples that I'm saying should motivate the development of the theory of spectral triples? Well, the things called Drinfeld Jimbo quantum groups. Um, so coming out of the work in Leningrad in the 1980s uh, on quantum integrable systems, people discovered um, a Q deformation of the Lie algebra, the universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra SL2. They were working, trying to find solutions of the Yang-Baxter equation, and this thing kind of fell from the sky. Nobody was expecting it. It's not something that, that came as a logical development of theory. It really was. It really did fall from the sky. Um, afterwards, then, this was built upon. It was like, it's not just SL2. This can be extended to any complex semi-simple Lie algebra. So we all know what these are because we had a course on it over the summer at the Mali Seminar from uh, Carmen. Um, again, remember, they're going to be they fall into, they're completely classified. They fall into four families, A, B, C, D, the S, L, S, O, odd, SP and SO even together with the exceptionals, E678, G F4 and G2. Um, <clears throat> and we've got this deformation here of their enveloping algebra. The Lie algebra itself doesn't deform because there's a cohomological uh, constraint here that says you can parameter you can parameterize all the possible deformations in terms of a cohomology theory, but in fact the cohomology group vanishes, so you have no deformations. But what does actually deform is going to be the enveloping algebra. To to form the enveloping algebra as an algebra is not particularly difficult because the thing can be presented in terms of generators and relations. You just stick some cues into the relations and you've got a generalization of your algebra. That's not particularly interesting. What's important about these things is that they actually, the Hopf algebra structure that's on this, the enveloping algebra of any Lie algebra, no need for semi-simplicity here, the enveloping algebra of any Lie algebra is automatically a Hopf algebra. And these deformations are still Hopf algebra structures, are still Hopf algebras. That's the constraint that makes the deformation interesting. Now we have a duly defined OQ of G, and that's basically, if you think of the Peter Weil theorem classically, you kind of construct OQ of G out of this Peter Weil, and this is going to be classically the representable functions, like Paolo was talking about two weeks ago, the representable functions on your uh, corresponding uh, compact, simply connected Lie group. Okay. Um, there is a little bit of a trick. These things are still a bit wild. They haven't, the UQ of G, they haven't been completely domesticated. So when Q goes to one, it's not actually U of G that you get back, you get a, a cover, a rank G plus one fold cover. But for purposes here, you can just assume that it goes to U of G. This won't really play any part. Okay, so deformations of Lie groups, which are very, which are in their essence, differential geometric objects occurring at the same time that Kahn and these theories of, of spectral triples and non-commutative uh, manifolds were coming together. So everybody looked at the two of these and said, fantastic, we should be able to put them together. That should take us a couple of years and we'll have an amazing theory. But 30 years later, it's still very, very badly understood. Um, so, but before we go on to the geometry, let's just call, recall some um, properties of this UQG that sort of motivate them as being important. So, the category of finite dimensional representations, which again classically is labeled by weights, weight spaces. Uh, this is going to be exactly the same. We have an equivalence of categories between UQ of G mod and U of G mod. So the representation theory stays the same, basically. Um, however, what doesn't stay the same, which is a subtle difference, but extremely important, which is basically at the, the heart of quantum groups, is that the monoidal structure, the tensor product of two representations, the monoidal structure that it puts in the category is different. The tensoring is kind of the same, but you can set up a monoidal equivalence because you, can, uh, you end up, and the map, the obvious uh, functor that you would write down giving an equivalence doesn't actually respect the Pentagon equation. So it's quite a subtle thing and it looks like category theorists being annoying, but it's actually not. It's, it's uh, what really makes the difference between the two of these things is the monoidal structure. Um, you can see this, for example, in the quantum dimension that's in the category of these things and so on. Um, 
But what is, and as well, I should say that this deformation is not unique. There were other deformations. The number of deformations is connected to Poisson structures and so on. But what is basically unique in some sense that can be made precise that we won't do here because this is just serving as motivation, is that the monoidal structure of this category is actually, it's a unique Q deformation of the monoidal structure. So basically the, this, this quantum category that you have associated here, this is basically unique. It's the unique deformation, but not the algebra itself. You have a number of different ways of realizing this category as a representation of a deformed enveloping algebra. All right. Um, I should also mention, I guess, that they have beautiful applications towards manifold invariants, uh, towards the work of Vaughan Jones, towards von Neumann algebras, uh, as we'll see later on, towards classical representation theory through canonical basis and so on. So these things that just, as I said, fell from the sky turn up have important applications or connections with many other areas of mathematics. Um, but despite all this, we still don't really understand that they're not committed to geometries. Um, so, but going back one step from the geometry, do, do we understand that their topology is, do they actually fit into Baranovich's framework? And, and they do quite nicely, actually. And it's not so difficult to see this once you understand the uh, representation theory underneath them all through the work of people like Gordon Winder and Dijkhausen. Um, so, topologically, they're very well behaved, quite well understood from the Seaster algebraic point of view. So then the natural question is, does the classical differential geometry, and as I've been saying, we now understood uh, that this is a much more difficult question. Okay. So, I mean, going back to the point of view of Khan, what we'd like to do here is just to take these things, this OQ of G would be the algebra, the dense algebra inside our C-star algebra. And then we'd like to have a Hilbert space to represent it on the Hilbert space together with some sort of non-commutative operator. But to write, this down to take a separable Hilbert space, write down a representation for these things and do it in a consistent way is going to be a nightmare. So what you need to do, or the uh, approach, I guess the one that we would follow is to try to take the classical geometry, Q to form it and build it up, eventually coming towards the spectral triple, which is classically a Q deformation of the Dirac operator, the spin Dirac operator and the spin manifold. Okay. So where do you start looking for some sort of a geometric thing? Well. Uh, Vardanovich was also working on this at this, the same time he was working on the compact quantum groups. He was doing the topology with an eye to going towards the geometry. And his idea was to look for Q deformations of the Durant complex. So for any manifold, any differential manifold, you have a complex associated to it, constructed uh, from the, it's a, an extension of these one forms. The one forms work, they're going to be dual modules to the vector fields. And then you have an extension up to a complex, which is to say a sequence of vector spaces together with a map, a degree one map connecting them, which squares to give you zero, which again encapsulates things that we all sort of remember from undergraduate, div, grad, and curl, and all of those identities. Um, so formalizing it, this, this uh, canonical thing, this object that you have associated to any differential manifold, the Duram complex, Cartan took that and abstracted the properties to a definition here of a differentially graded algebra. So if you don't know what a manifold is, you don't know, if, I guess you know what a manifold is, but if you're not so comfortable with the definition of the Durham complex, basically it's something like this. It's an example of a differentially graded algebra that's canonically associated to any manifold, coming from a dual construction. Okay, so N graded, as I was saying, it's going to be a graded algebra. So of course the multiplication is going to respect addition inside the natural numbers. And then this degree one map, when you square it, is going to go to zero. And of course, it has to satisfy the Leibniz rule. Um, and basically, in differential geometry, this is where most of differential geometry will take place, at least in the nice global formulation of differential geometry that, that non commutative geometry is like. This is basically the setting for modern differential geometry. Okay, so we're trying to put Voronovich's idea was we would look for these guys over the quantum groups, over the polynomial algebras, the OQ of G of the quantum groups. Um, and by introducing some symmetry, it should hopefully just pop out that there's a naturally unique one like there is in the classical case. And we can start to build up non commutative geometry. Um, but we should just go back a little bit. Uh, we want to put a small extra constraint on this. We wanted these things are generated in degree zero. Okay, and this means there's a differentially graded algebra. So it's going to be generated by elements of the form A and DB because that's actually what happens on a classical manifold. So the, the previous definition was, was of a general differentially graded algebra, but we really because we're trying, we're trying to remember, preserve, we're motivated by classical geometry, we put this extra condition. 
you can prove this using some partition of unity argument on a manifold. Okay. Now, because we're looking at Lie quantum Lie groups, Q deformations of Lie groups, we also want that the calculus preserves some sort of symmetry. Okay. And that there are a number of equivalent ways you can formulate it, but we'll do it in terms of the UQ of G. So with the dual pairing between OQ of G and UQ of G, you can turn that into an action. And then you want that action to extend from functions from the degree zero form up to the entire DGA. And you want it to commute with the um, differential. You want the differential to be a module map with respect to this action. And this, of course, all happens classically. Because whenever you're for the unique differential structure on the Lie group, which is covariant with respect to the group structure. Okay. The question is, and similarly, because you can a group acts on itself from the left and the right, you'd also want the similar thing happening on the right, and you want the two of them to agree in the obvious way by module structure. And then this thing is about, it would be what, if this is what we call a bicovariant calculus. Question is, now let's sit down and try to find these for OQG, and the hope is that it's going to be these conditions here will actually show that they're unique. And that's where the first problem with this approach arose. This is, was observed, I guess, the end of the 90s, something like this, when it became clear that uh, this is a result of Schmudgen and maybe Fuller. I should know, but I can't remember off the top of my head. But they proved that there basically doesn't exist a bicovariant calculus of classical dimension. You can remove it and just have your covariance on one side, but then that's very artificial and so on. And this is a big stumbling block. And this is where a lot of people said, okay, maybe this approach isn't actually a particularly good one. So my opinion to this is that actually, and what a lot of us are coming around to the point of view is that one needs to relax the definition of a differential graded algebra to remove the, the Leibniz or to generalize the Leibniz rule to some sort of a twisted Leibniz rule. But you know, that's one thing to say that this is what it is and actually to build up a coherent structure around it and prove it is another thing. So we're going to actually come at it from a different direction based on a surprising results that came, a number of results that came just as people were starting to abandon this idea here, started to discover that there were a class of manifolds for which it actually did work. And that's when we start to come on to flag manifolds, which is in the title of the talk. Basically trying to come at a different approach to avoid this problem of the non-commutative, of the non of the quantum differential calculi for quantum groups not existing. So the, just as I was saying before, the dual pairing that you have, you can turn that into an action means you're just going to take the co-product of the thing and then collapse on the well, first and the second factor, depending on whether you want a right or a left action. Um, in particular, let's specialize down to the case of SU2, because even, even for this case, uh, this calculus doesn't exist. Even for this case, we don't understand the theory of spectral triples on these, even for the, the simplest example, we really don't understand the non-commutative geometry in that for 30 years. But with this action, which again, you should think about classically as vector fields acting on functions. So you're differentiating your vector fields, a directional derivative of your vector field as we would have seen in undergraduate differential geometry, undergraduate multivariable calculus. Um, of course, inside an SL2, you've got a Cartan, you've got a unit universal enveloping algebra of the Cartan that lives inside here, a Cartan we represent by H as usual. So that gives us an action of the torus on SU2, okay? So nothing so crazy so far. Now we can look at the invariant elements with respect to this. That's to say the elements for which this, the Cartan, the universal, sorry, there shouldn't be a Q there. The universal enveloping algebra of the Cartan uh, is going to act and you want it to act by the co-unit of the Hopf algebra. So you basically your, your generators in their K1 and K and K inverse are just going to act as the identity. Uh, classically, what that gives you are going to be the representable functions on the two-sphere. That's because the two-sphere, which is to say, or well, CP1 equivalently, is uh, SU2 quotiented by U1. Classical, basically the classical Hopf vibration. And in the quantum setting, this definition of the invariance carries over directly, as Padlesh observed for an OHS student. And what you get is going to be a subalgebra that lives inside there, which is called the Padlesh sphere. And when Q goes to one, this actually gives you back an algebra in three generators, X, Y, Z, together with one relation, which is to say X squared plus Y squared plus Z squared is equal to one. So actually it does give you back the algebra functions on the sphere when Q goes to one. So it's all very sensible. It turns out that for this guy, not for SU2, but for the subalgebra, suddenly all of the problems that we had 
trying to describe the different non commutative geometry of quantum SU2, or more generally OQG, go away and everything actually works. You have a calculus, you have a unique Q deformation, unique optic pathologies, a unique Q deformation of the Duram complex. It'll only be covariant in one side, of course, because uh, we've only got an action. If you look at SU2, we've only got an action of SU2. Uh, because we're quotienting out on the left, we've only got an action on the right. So it's, it's a homogeneous space, but we've only got an action from one side. Of course, this carries over directly to the non commutative setting because quotienting out here on the left, um, which means, of course, that the only covariance that you want to carry, you only have on your calculus, you've only got a covariance from, from the left. So that's what you ask to carry over. And that basically uniquely identifies it. From it, you can, this is a Kähler manifold classically. So inside there you have spin Dirac operator or spin C Dirac operator, that can directly Q deform. So you come and you check the axioms for Khan. The lower axioms all work. And this was done by Dombrowski, Ludwig Dombrowski and Andrzej Sidarch back maybe in the 2000s, early 2000s. Everything works. Some, although not, okay, when I say everything, I don't mean everything. Some of these higher axioms of Khan, actually quite a few of them, don't work on the nose, but they work or they fail in an interesting way which sort of hints at how all of these things need to be q deformed, how one would help, how pointing a direction for the, uh, what am I saying, to figure out what finally, what the correct definition of a non-commutative manifold is. This is just one example. Oh, for some people that's enough, they carry on working with this for the rest of their lives. We would like to extend it up and you should have a large family of examples and all of these things should work coherently and that's going to be a lot more convincing than just one example, obviously. So how do we generalize? What's the direction we go in? Is this sphere a special example of something, a special example of something that admits a natural generalization? Well, the two sphere is classically a compact, simply connected SC2 homogeneous Kähler manifold. What is Kähler? Kähler means that it's a complex manifold, which is to say your um, atlas, your differential atlas, the transition functions of your differential atlas are going to be complex holomorphic functions. It's also Riemannian, and then the Riemannian structure interacts with the complex structure in the nicest way possible. We'll see what this means later on, but they're fantastic manifolds. They're about as good as it gets. Um, and there were a lot of people try to make things that are no longer Kähler manifolds look like Kähler manifolds. I remember being at a differential geometry conference in Poland once, and somebody was talking about almost nearly para Kähler manifolds. It was like this guy had an example and he wasn't given up. He was going to make it look like a killer manifold if it killed him. Um, but that's a testament to how nice they actually are, how beautiful the theory is. And in fact, uh, these things have a name. If, if you generalize up and you want to look at all, so the natural generalization is do we have compact, simply connected G homogeneous scalar manifolds? We do. And these are what are called flag manifolds. Basically, the. Yeah the generalization from SL2 up to G, frac G. These can equivalently, so they actually turn out to have a very completely classifiable, it's a discrete classification, and they can be presented as, as quotients of this form, G over some, a special type of subgroup called the Levy subgroup, of which the motivating example is going to be the torus inside an SU2. And roughly speaking, the definition of the Levy is, it's going to be some subgroup of G that contains a maximal torus. So again, for SU2, it was just the torus. More generally, when you have subgroups that contain the torus and everything is as it is, that, that's what a levy is. So the torus action here is, is, is central to the whole thing. Um, and these are indexed by subsets of the simple roots of G. So if you don't remember what those are from the Annie Lee theory education you've had, take the rank of, of your Lie algebra G and then the rank of SL2 was one, for example, the rank of SL3 is two. And you want, you label these in a particular graphical way in order to classify these things in terms of things called Dinkin diagrams and choosing subsets of, of this, uh, subsets of the nodes of these diagrams is basically what's going on. And that's how you label your flag manifold. So there's a, a discrete classifying set index. Okay. So, that's all fine, this is all classical. Can we mimic, so remember over here, um, we were able to take this torus action, look at a corresponding subgroup with the universal enveloping algebra and then look for invariance. And that was a direct generalization of the algebra of functions on the homogeneous space, on this quotient space. 
can we do this for, for these guys, the more general? And we can, and it's, it carries over directly from the classical setting, and it's basically, it was first introduced by Stockman, but it's uh, basically, once you know the classical definition, it's completely natural. So these are our E's, F, sorry, K's, E's, and F's. These are going to be, in your Lie algebra, you decompose the Lie algebra into eigenspaces of the action of the Cartan. And they split it up into things called, the, so these eigenspaces are all one-dimensional. So you have a central part, I guess, which is going to be degree zero, um, which is not one-dimensional, but all the other guys are. And you have E's and you have F's. It splits up into positive and negative in your Cartan. So think about SL2 is going to be the trace-free matrices, and your E is going to be the entry both the diagonal and the F's below the diagonal, and then the torus, the, the diagonal is going to be the, the Cartan part. That's basically, if you keep this in mind, you won't go wrong. And the universal enveloping algebra of the Lie algebra is generated by these guys, as in the commutative and by definition in the classic, sorry, in the commutative case and by definition in the quantum setting. Um, sorry, here that should be general G. So in this talk, we're actually going to be specializing to SLN, so I introduced it a little bit too quickly, but this definition holds for all of the semi-simple Lie algebras. So you take the subalgebra, you look for the covariance of it, just, and here, that's actually the covariance, the definition of the covariance, where the epsilon is going to be the co-unit of the uh, UQ of G. How does it act? It's going to kill these and the Fs, and it acts, it brings K to 1. So this will classically give you back the algebra of representable algebraic polynomial functions on your classical flag manifold. Carries over directly. Everything's great. So the question is, what happened for Padlet for quantum S2, quantum CP1, can we extend that up to this class of manifolds? Okay, not bad. Um, turns out that in general, we don't know. However, for these amazing class of spaces, it works, as we'll see in the next definition. So remember I told you before that you had Dinkin diagrams that were classifying, that were the way to, I guess, that gave a visual representation of the classification of the Lie algebras. These are the Dinkin diagrams, the A series, SLN, the B, S, O, C, S, P, S, O, S, O, and then exceptionals. There are three exceptionals that are missing here because they don't fall into this family. And what I've done is this subset S that I've been talking about before. This is a subset of the simple roots, okay? And I'm denoting that by coloring it in. Now, in this case, if I've colored in two of them, it means that S in this case is going to have size one. I'm just crossing one node. If I've crossed two, it means that the corresponding algebra is very isomorphic. okay? And in the top series, you can cross anything. In the B series, you just cross the first one, the last one, first one here, either the top or the bottom uh, node, in the, the horns as they call them, and here either the first or the last, and here only the last. Why are these spaces special? Well, in the classical setting, these are flag manifolds, hence they're Kähler manifolds, they're Hermitian manifolds. They're also symmetric spaces. So symmetric spaces are another class of homogeneous spaces of simple Lie groups G, which are also very nicely behaving and very important for many reasons. And if you go in the intersection of symmetric spaces and uh, flag manifolds, you get precisely this set here. And if the flag manifolds are good, then these guys are even better. They're probably the best manifolds there are. Um, they've got it all. And it turns out that in the quantum setting, when you carry over for these spaces, um, okay, so they're defined in the same way. So you've got this, this uh, right, well, I guess it's left action, right action, depending on the convention. For these spaces, it turns out that there is a unique, again, unique up to pathologies, covariant um, differential structure. And it's got classical dimension, everything works. And all of the great things that worked for the um, Duran complex of the Padlet sphere of quantum CP1 carry over directly to this setting, to this class of manifolds, which is great. Um, question now, of course, is this spectral triple, this, this non commutative geometry in the sense of con that was constructed for these things, does that extend up? And this is still work in progress, uh, not what I'll talk about today, well, but. Um, in the 15 years since then, we've learned a lot about the structure, their complex geometry, their Kähler geometry, non-commutative Kähler geometry, cohomology, and their completion to the spectral triple in the sense of Kahn. This is not finished. We've, we've got the operators. We've got the direct, direct Q deformation of this Dalbo-Dirac operator. 
We've got the Hilbert space. Um, we've shown that it satisfies most of the analytic properties that it should, but we're missing this compact resolving condition. I'll talk about this a little bit at the end. But you know, it's it's work in progress. We certainly show that it should work, and at some point it will actually have worked. So, so this class of this very nice class of manifolds, quantum manifolds, quantum homogeneous spaces, basically everything extends up to them. But now the question is, why just these classes? What happens if we extend up to larger classes, more uh, larger uh, subsets of our, our Dinkin, of, of nodes of our Dinkin diagram? What if we go up to more general types of flag manifolds? Does everything fall apart? Do we end up going to the situation where we were with quantum SU2 and OQG that we don't have anything? Well, honestly, this has never really been looked at before. These spaces have not been examined very well from a differential, non-commutative to differential geometry point of view. Sorry, this is point two. That's what I was just discussing. Uh, but if we answer this, that might hopefully shed some light on where these things come from, because the construction of Heckenberger and Kolb, um, maybe I didn't stress that, this result was proved by Heckenberger and Kolb in yeah, 2006. A fantastic result, probably one of the most important results in the non-commutative geometry of quantum groups. Uh, but the construction doesn't give you so much insight into where they come from or why they appear. So I guess we'd like to understand better where they come from, simplify even the construction of them because it's quite technical. And maybe we can do this by trying extending up, trying to get everything in one go. And this is what we're going to discuss today. This is basically that these are the results that we're going to talk about. Now, what we won't talk about, but what one might hope is that eventually by answering these two questions and extending up to all of the flags, perhaps eventually then we begin to see how to... Karen, that's a question. Yeah. What does all classical dimension? Uh, so classically, it's a, man, it's a vector bundle. So you can talk about the dimension of a vector bundle. And it's, it's that. So, okay, so I guess she's... With respect to the These things are examples of non-commutative homogeneous vector bundles, I guess, which is to say they're relative Hopf modules, which means that classically a homogeneous vector bundle, it's a vector bundle over a homogeneous space that respects the symmetry, they're classified by inducing representations, which are basically the, the fiber of the vector bundle, the representation. Classically, this, construct, uh, this construction carries over to the non-commutative setting, um, and it gives us a notion of dimension for these homogeneous vector bundles that's well defined. Because of course, something like projective dimension doesn't work, which is a problem. So it's through Takeuchi's equivalence. Um, but I guess a classical dimension means two things. It means that for each component of the graded algebra, but it also means that the graded algebra finishes at the point it finishes classically. That you get like the dimension of an exterior algebra. For the thing. And anyway, we'd hope that if we could answer these two questions here, then it might give us some idea of just eventually come back and solve the problem of OQG. But that's not what we're going to talk about today. This is, I guess, motivation for the two of these. So how do we do this? Well, we go back and see when you're trying to construct these differential calculi. And here you can get maybe the notion of dimension again. You actually classify them in terms of, okay, I'm, waving, I'm being a little bit imprecise here. It should really be the, the half tool of these guys. But of OQ of G, but let's say OQ of G because everything's more or less the same. Trying to look for sub spaces inside here uh, that satisfy these conditions. Maybe actually I'll go forward to the next slide here. This might give a little bit more intuition. So classically, this is not specific to the flag manifolds. I'll just write it down for the flag manifolds so we don't have to introduce new notation. But whenever you have a homogeneous space, the corresponding Lie algebra of the thing that you're quotienting by will give us, we'll have an exact sequence like this on top. The exact sequence splits, which is to say, we're going to have a decomposition of G into the Lie algebra of the subgroup, the isotropy subgroup, and the tangent space of this guy. So your tangent spaces for your, um, which are going to be dual, of course, to the one forms, these things live inside in the Lie algebra. This is sort of how it works. So that's, that's where this construction here comes from. Uh, this is basically an example of a more general theory due to Hermesen, which is a lot of the foundational work on this, and Heckenberger and Kolb. Generalizing work of Voronovich on the group case. I guess it was Hermesen who realized that the algebraic property of faithful flatness was crucial to all of this working. 
um, we were able to classify these, these differential graded algebras, or at least the degree one part of them, the omega one. You're able to classify these in terms of subspaces of the corresponding universal enveloping algebra, which makes sense because what you're really doing is sort of looking at the, the vector fields on the invariant vector fields on your homogeneous space. And of course, from this, you get the tangent space, which you generalize to give you the, the one forms and so on. And this is basically a quantum generalization of this. So these are the algebraic conditions you need to make it work to set up the equivalents. If this works, then you introduce this guy, which are going to be the tangent vectors. So this is sort of an invariant subspace of the tensor product. And it's just like this associated vector bundle construction that I was talking about a second ago to answer the question of what dimension meant. Um, classically, this would be the associated vector bundle, the sections of the associated vector bundle associated to this representation, because it is a representation because we've got this condition. Okay. That's what we're doing. We're just mimicking or direct extension of the classical construction of an associated vector bundle or the sections of an associated vector bundle. And from this tangent space, we can dualize in the same way that classically we have vector fields and we dualize to forms. And we get a differential graded algebra of length one, which is to say omega two and so on. There's nothing there. We can just put zeros. Just to say, we've basically got a bimodule. Um, we've got a map from our functions into this bimodule, which satisfies the Leibniz rule. And then this guy is going to be spanned by elements of the form B, D, B prime. Okay, just like it would be in the classical setting. So we've got, so if we can find these correct tangent spaces, then we have a corresponding one forms. After that, in fact, then there's a universal construction that works for any differential graded algebra of length one. Um, you extend it up, there's a, a largest extension to a differential graded algebra, uh, which is maximal in the sense that any other extension is going to be a quotient of this and then it's universal with respect to this property. This is an equivalent formulation of taking the exterior algebra of your of one forms only the one. But this works a lot better in the non-commutative setting because if you just try to take the exterior algebra of this, because you're your relations here and your, your functions are all q deformed, it would be a complete mess and totally wrong. But if you take this universal extension, it's the correct um, notion in the non commutative setting of, of exterior algebra. Sorry, yeah. Uh, here, I didn't really. <laughs> what happens is you take a co product. You take the co-product, first entry goes here, and then the second entry goes into, um, well, you're, you're taking a common kernel of all of the elements here, considered as acting on the functions of this, quotienting out by this common kernel, and then you're going to get a quotient. You're going to get something like this plus, in fact, over an ideal, and then you take co-product and you take the coset of the second factor in the, the tensor product of the Just like it happens classically, it might look very strange in comparison to the classical situation, but that's how it works. So this is how Heckenberger and Cole did their classification. They looked for these guys. And it turns out that because this Hermitian symmetric, this one winter flags and symmetric spaces at the same time, because this is so restrictive, everything is quite tight. They were able to classify them and show that they, there were only one, well, two in fact, the holomorphic and anti-holomorphic parts, just as you would classically. But when we go outside of this, even classically, this uniqueness no longer holds. So you can't use this as your guide somehow to finding the correct non commutative notion. So you have to think of something else. Um, how to extend the on. So here's this exact sequence I spoke about before. I should really have put that before on the slides. But problem is then, if you want to look, so what you would say is, okay, if, if the structure of the CQ of G is quite similar in that in some ways, different in others, but similar in some ways, to the classical situation, particularly from a representation theoretic point of view, could you not just try to find this tangent space, try to decompose this guy into two parts, just like you have the decomposition here classically. If you look at it, it should be clear, no? And that would be your tangent space, and then you go through this whole procedure and construct them and everything is easy. It's not quite that easy. In fact, it's far from that easy. And the remarkable fact is that despite all of the effort and work of many uh, talented people on quantum groups over the last 30 years, we still don't actually have 
a Lie algebra, or some sort of braided or quantum Lie algebra that lives inside an or enveloping algebra. Why nobody has figured this out yet, or why it hasn't come through, I don't really have a proper answer, but we don't. So one proposal to solve this comes by from Shan Majid, it's the notion of a braided Lie algebra, which is there. Uh, but another approach is due to George Lustig, which comes from his generalization of the PBW theorem. So let me um, explain what's going on here. So what he was trying to do, so classically you have something called the PBW theorem, which is a basis from a basis of your enveloping algebra that comes from uh, elements of the root spaces, which is to say these common eigenvectors of the axis of the torus. And he wanted to try to find non-commute or quantum analogs of these. And it's not obvious, it's not obvious at all what they should be, because you ended up, you have these commutation brackets classically, and they need to be Q-deformed in some sort of a coherent way. So what he did was he was able to introduce this family of automorphisms. This is quite technical, but I'll just give it to you since we can give it explicitly, um, where we have these quantum integer deformations of these classical values. And through this, he determined a homomorphism of the braid group onto the algebra of automorphisms. So associated to any Lie algebra, you have its vial group, which let's say in the A series setting for SLN is just going to be the symmetric group. The other ones is going to be semi-direct product of the symmetric group with other things. Then, but these braid groups have, have covers where you remove in, if you look at the generators and relations presentation of the symmetric group, you have a relation inside there that's going to be for any transposition. When you apply it twice, you get back the identity. So if I flip two adjacent guys and then I flip them back, it's just the identity. So you remove that part from the definition, you remove that part from the defining relations of your file group, and then you're going to get what's called the corresponding braid group. And he showed that you had an action here of the braid group on, on your UQG. And this somehow, this fact that if you do something twice classically, in the quantum case, that doesn't actually always happen. And it's closely related to the braided monoidal structure of the category and so on. You can even think about it as the physics, when you twist the electron twice, you end up getting back a different electron, you know, getting a minus one in front. So this braid group is somehow central to the structure of UQG. But what he did was that for every, uh, take the longest element on the vial group. So again, think about the symmetric group, and well, the, the braid group of, this, of, of the A series, the, Braid group constructed from the symmetric group. Take the longest elements, and oh, sorry, this is for the vial, so we're actually okay. So take the longest element of the vial group, longest element of the symmetric group in the A series case, and then we can associate to it these root vectors coming from these actions of Lustig that you have earlier on. Classically, this actually gives you the root vectors, these eigenspaces of the eigenvectors of the action of the, the torus. He showed that this carried over once you're careful about using the braid group and not the vial group, because that's how, it, that, that's how it looks in the quantum setting. So he was able to produce all of these root vectors. And classically, the Lie algebra inside in, a copy of the Lie algebra in the enveloping algebra is actually spanned by these root vectors and the cartel. So these things are a very natural candidate for G inside there. It's not that simple, I guess, but it's a good way to think about it. Uh, he showed then that, of course, this PBW basis, this basis, algebra basis, constructed from these generators um, carries over directly to the non-commutative setting once, once you set up these, these root vectors correctly. So if you put all of these to degree one, you've sort of got, well, no, sorry. If you look at all of these root vectors, you've sort of got something that looks a bit like G. Okay, it's not in any formal sense, but kind of looks like it. I should mention here, I probably don't have time to go and drop the names, but uh, Lustig went on and used this for a huge, I mean, has huge influence towards the, the theory of, of quantum groups. In particular, it's the start for his theory of canonical basis, which itself has many applications to classical representation theory of the algebra is a surprising application of the quantum set, the quantum uh, realm results in the quantum realm to classical representation theory, but that's uh, another discussion. What we're going to focus on though is that these root vectors, and we make the naive guess that these root vectors are actually going to give us some sort of a tangent space. It's a naive guess, might not work out, but you know, you make a naive guess, you figure out why it was naive, then you try to fix it and so on. Um, so we're just going to introduce this, this notation here for these root vectors. 
Classically, this would be the span of the positive and the negative part of your Lie algebra. In the SLN case, the entries above the diagonal and the entries below the diagonal. Okay. Um, and yeah, so that's the point. We're now going to look and try to construct from these a tangent space, not for any flag manifold, but for the full. And that is the same as, remember before we had this, this diagram where we crossed these very specific nodes of the Lincoln diagram? Here we're going to cross everything. It's somehow like the other extreme. It's like the smallest possible quotient because you're quotienting your, your G by the maximal torus inside there. And remember the levy is somehow some subgroup that contains the maximal torus. Of course, the maximal torus contains itself. This is a levy subgroup and we can consider this quotient. And it corresponds graphically to crossing all the nodes. Now what's special about these is that they contain every other flag manifold as a subalgebra. So if we could figure out the geometry here, if we could figure out the tangent space, then it should be possible to restrict. That would be the idea and maybe it should work. Um, and if we just go back, remember this, this idea that we've got inside, we've got a decomposition of G into uh, the letter. Ramon, I have a, I have a question. Yeah. Sorry. Ramon? Yeah, yes. Yeah. So I don't understand what the full flag contains because think about that. You know, if you think about the projective space, the yeah. projective space is the farthest from full flag and it contains yeah. all the flags. So I'm a bit confused. About this. Yeah, that's a word. I mean, that's going the other direction, I guess. That's the plucker embedding or whatever, but that's more difficult. For the flags, it's easy. If, if you look at it algebraically, let's go back um, to the definition. Yeah, so I'm not sure I understand what you meant, that's all. So we're asking that for, any, for it to be inside here in the algebra, of, in the flag manifold, it has to be that any element in our levy is going to act on this G. I see, I see, I see. Okay, sorry about the question. Okay. okay. Yeah, you know, I mean, your, your point is correct, but it's basically going in the opposite direction. No, 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 okay, it's, sorry, okay. It's, it's easier than Plucker, yeah, for sure. So thanks for the question. Um, so what we're taking, uh, well, actually, let's, let's, let's stop here since we're here. Uh, this decomposition here is just going to be the levy. In this case, it's just going to be the torus. It's just going to be the cartan. And then classically, and then we've got this tangent space, which is basically made up of the positive and the negative roots inside nearly algebra. But that is exactly what we have here. Lustig has sort of shown us what this thing should be. So the naive guess is what if we take this as our tangent space, try to go back and look at these conditions here, Verify these conditions for the space, this thing that Lustig introduced. Verify these conditions that can be constructed. It's kind of a naive guess. It's sort of too good to be true that this, this uh, amazing theorem that he's proved here would actually be precisely the thing that we needed in order to solve the problem of the non commutative geometry of quantum groups. Sometimes it's good to be naive and guess. Um, and in this case, it actually is. So it turns out that for, remember, we have weight spaces for every single reduced expression of the longest element of the Weyl group. And it turns out that there are precisely two for which everything works. And there's somehow the extremal ones, the ones that are the simplest. It turns out that the associated guys, T and T prime, are quantum tangent spaces in the sense I just said. Uh, for the full flag manifold, they have an associated differential calculus of classical dimension. Everything works exactly as you would want it to. So we were pretty happy about this, that suddenly everything actually just fits together. And the non-commutative geometry, the differential calculus of, this is in the A series as well, I should, because so we, we restricted to here just because the A series is the place where you always start. Um, we haven't touched the other series yet. But lying in plain sight, the uh, non-commutative geometry there was just basically in Lustig's PBW theorem all along, but nobody thought to look. The calculation is not, I mean, actually proving this is not trivial. There were a lot of tricks that need to be brought in. We have to rely back on Heckenberg's Heckenberg codes classification and so on and so forth. But at the end of the day, it actually works and it works perfectly. So we were extremely happy with this. No, of course, the question is why do we stop here? I mean, if this works so nicely, then perhaps the complex geometry, maybe even the Kähler geometry carries over just like it did for Podlet and more generally for these irreducible flags. I should notice as well, so I'll, uh, the restriction of these, maybe I say this in the next, yeah. First of all, these calculate also, when you restrict them to the subalgebra, remember, we were just talking about every flag manifold lives inside in the full flag. When you restrict this differential structure to the 
the subalgebras, what do you get back? Well, for the Grassmannians, that's to say the Heckenberger cold calculus in the A series, just one grass anywhere in your, your first Dinkin diagram, you get back the calculus that they had. And these two choices, this like I and I prime, they collapse down to the same thing. Basically, the Grassmannian doesn't see the difference between these two things. So we get back the calculus that Heckenberger cold would found straight up directly. And that kind of gives us an answer to our first question is like, where did these things come from? Well, they come from Lustig's presentation of root spaces and PBW theorem, non commutatively. So this works for everything in between. And it works for everything in between. That's the next thing I would say then. So for all of these other crosses that we have, all of these other possible flag manifolds between these two extremes, between the extreme of our irreducible, the Grassmannians on one side and the flag here, for everything in between, all of this works as well. You get a differential calculus, you get classical dimension. You get two, of course, which is kind of mysterious. We still don't understand why we have two, but it's, it's an, interesting, an interesting phenomenon. Um, oh yeah, and that's exactly what I'm saying here. So for all of the other A-series flag manifolds, all of these other guys between these two extremes, um, both these are differential calculi and the restricted differential calculus of classical dimension. When Q goes back to one, you get the Duran complex. Everything works. And again, this, this is, the flags, suddenly, if you look at them in the right way, everything really works out properly, which is so much in contrast to OQG themselves, where nothing works. Um, now, we start to go a bit faster. We've now found the DRAM. We found some of the, the differential geometry, but these guys have a lot more than differential geometry, have a lot more than plain differential geometry because classically they're complex manifolds. They're Kähler manifolds. That was in fact how we defined them as homogeneous simply connected Kähler manifolds. So classically a complex manifold splits up, I guess the, the, you have an equivalent formulation of the notion of a complex manifold, not just as your uh, transition functions and your, your differential atlas being holomorphic, you can equivalently define it as, as two parts, an almost complex structure together with an integrability condition. This is the almost complex structure. As I was saying before, in more modern differential geometry, all of the differential geometry can kind of be done in the DRAM complex. And that's also true for this holomorphic atlas that you would have. You ask for a decomposition, you ask for a refinement of your N grading, this uh, complex, down to an N2 grading. So it ends up splitting basically like a diamond. That's an almost complex structure. Every complex manifold, has a complex structure. You want it, of course, to interact with the star map that you have on these as well. All of these things are star algebras because we're thinking about them as pre-C star algebras. Um, no, wait, I'm sorry. This last condition here shouldn't be there because I've got almost. That shouldn't be there. We should just have this. Okay. This is precisely what you need for a complex manifold. And this is precisely, you can put an almost complex mani manifold structure on a space for any complex manifold, but you can put them on spaces where this does not come from a complex structure and it comes from a complex structure if and only if this condition here is satisfied. So that's, uh, that'll be explained a little bit more in the next slide. So let's just deal with the almost, the first two conditions for the moment. This is what I'm talking about, the splitting up of our complex. So here, this would be, for example, a four-dimensional complex manifold, it's just a straight line, the, the differential geometric part of it. But when you take into account the complex structure, you get this breaks it into this diamond, this so-called Hodge diamond. Okay, and all of these guys here are just these del and del bar are just going up with your differential and then projecting onto immediately to the left or immediately to the right. Okay. So it's the, yeah, the, the extra structures or manifold being reflected in the Duram complex. Uh, these are the two operators, as I said, it's just compose your differential T with projection immediately to the left and immediately to the right. And it turns out that condition three is equivalent, it holds if and only if D is equal to del bar. So if you have an almost complex structure, this associated complex, that this associated diamonds that you have, I mean, well, that's the defining diamond of, a, of the complex structure. This comes from a holomorphic atlas on your manifold if and only if this condition here is satisfied, which is equivalent if and only if to this, this diamond here actually being not a complex, but a double complex. So in all of the different lines, you end up, when you go twice, you end up getting zero. So your del bar, del squared or del bar squared are both going to be zero. Uh, so this equivalence is actually, you might, might as well give it a shout, the Newlander-Nuremberg theorem. It's, it's this, this last 
here is actually very difficult. It's a very complex, very uh, really hard analysis proof, um, but it gives us an amazing definition in the non-commutative setting of what a non-commutative complex manifold should be, a direct generalization of the classical one. Um, building on that, you can then ask what would a Hermitian structure look like? Well, uh, classically, well, let's define it. We're asking for a, a Hermitian structure, this Riemannian structure on top of our complex structure that interacts with the complex structure in a suitable way. Well, you would want a, we ask for a form. I'll explain the classical motivation in a second. We want a complex structure. We want a form, a one-one form, something that lives in this uh, degree one, one in the middle, the second, second row. We want this to be central. We want it to be invariant under the star map. And crucially, we want isomorphisms to be given by these L maps, these Lefschetz maps, which are basically, you construct a multiplication operator out of your form and use this to try to get symmetry in your, in your uh, Hodge diamond. Okay. And if in addition to all of this, you have that this form, the sigma up here, which is now denoted by a kappa because we're going from Hermitian to Kähler. If this is closed, which is to say if dk is equal to zero, then this is what's called Kähler. And this is equivalent to the classical definition of Kähler. And this simple condition here makes an enormous difference classically between a Hermitian manifold and a Kähler manifold. Going from here to here, it seems like a very small thing to require, but it's actually enormous. The long list of miracles associated with this is the same that goes, um, I think by Bourguignon, who actually spoke here a couple of years ago in this room. Um, so what is the classical motivation for this? Well, classically, this one, one form as what's called the associated fundamental form of the metric. So whenever you have a, a metric on your form for which the N2 grading, this extra refinement of the grading um, is that these are perpendicular to each other, that's going to be a Hermitian metric basically, that it sees the complex structure. And associated to any one of those, you get a fundamental form, which is given by this. You take the metric and this I is going to be the thing that determines the N2 grading by operating on it by a multiple of, of minus I, plus minus I roughly. Uh, this gives you a two form. And then that two form satisfies all of the properties that we had before. But in the non-commutative setting, because this is here somehow built into it is the assumption that we're working with a thing which is the exterior algebra of something. But as I said before, in the non-commutative setting, you can't take the exterior algebra because it would just be a complete mess. We've taken this other formulation of the exterior algebra, this one that was given in terms of this maximal prolongation of a first order calculus. And that's why it turns out to be easier to go in this direction, to actually start off with a fundamental form and to construct a metric from it. But anyway, uh, so that's all well and good with all of these definitions. Uh, do these things actually work for our examples that we found, these uh, differential calculi that come from the differential calculi and the full flags and all the other flags that are contained inside there that come from this Lustig PPW theorem. Do any of these things exist? It turns out that yes. For each of the A-series flag manifolds, and either choice of the longest element of the Weil group, these two extremal ones for which the calcul calculus exists, the differential calculus admits a complex structure in the way we say. Moreover, this complex structure interacts. It's a decomposition of modules with respect to UQG, as it would be classically, because your complex structure on any of these uh, flag manifolds is going to be covariant. The corresponding, and this, uh, this is, can be uh, uniquely identified as the decomposition of the tangent space into the one zero and the zero ones, your positive and your negative roots. So that's what's happening with these flag manifolds, why they're complex. Basically, you've got the tangent space, which is like your Lie algebra, you take, which is your Lie algebra, but you've taken out the torus. You've taken out the Cartan part. And you're left with the positive and the negative, and that gives you your decomposition. Dually, that gives you your decomposition, and this carries over directly. And this decomposition of the one form extends up to a decomposition of the whole thing. Uh, moreover, it satisfies that condition three I was talking about, that your, your D decomposes into a direct sum of this del plus del bar. So not only do we have this like non-commutative, almost complex structure, but it's integrable. It should somehow, we can think about it as coming from some sort of non-commutative uh, holomorphic atlas on our, our non-commutative space. Um, and moreover, we also get the metric. So we have one of these, these one, one forms. It satisfies all of these conditions on the left shits maps, the associated symmetries that you have around the central line of your Durham complex. 
and it satisfies the magic condition that d kappa is equal to zero, that this form is actually killed. Everything carries over. And the associated metric that we get, the one that we've constructed by going backwards from the classical, this is actually a positive definite metric. Although here I'm lying a little bit, we're only able to prove it for all but a finite number of values of Q. Conjecture that it holds for everything, um, but possibly there's a finite number of values for Q for which it works. I strongly suspect it doesn't, because I mean, that would probably be too interesting that you would have certain values of Q that don't actually like this complex structure. Uh, so it's kind of a win-win situation. If we find things where it does work, that's something interesting, but uh, we guess that it works for everything. We'll probably want more. Um, now, in addition to that, we can take classical Hodge decomposition. Sort of say, we've got all of this geometric structure. How can we actually use it to say something about the structure of the differential graded algebras themselves? So differential graded algebras have got cohomology. Classically, I mean, to try to calculate cohomology always is, is difficult. On a classical manifold, you try, you, Hodge theory, Hodge decomposition, sets up an equivalence between or a bijective linear map between your cohomology groups and kernel and these harmonic forms, which are to say kernel of the Dirac, which I think I forgot to define, but that's easily done. Hopefully you can see it here. So we've got three Dirac, so I've got del, del bar, and D. And the Laplacian is just the square. And these H's are the kernel of this operator here. Okay, so this is just like in any Kähler manifold, we're going to have three different Dirac operators. Um, and these are eventually, these guys are going to be the, we would want, these would be the candidates for the spectral triple in the sense of con. And in fact, if you reduce down to the very special case of S2 of Podlish, this guy is the one that I was talking about earlier on that was found by Danbrovsky and Sitouch in a very, not a very geometric way, but in a very calculation uh, basis, uh, lots of hard work presentation. So what's amazing though, is that classically, you've got the kernel of these operators, the harmonic forms as they call them, actually are, you have a linear bijection between these and cohomology classes. The kernel of these things are easier to calculate than cohomology. So it gives you a way to calculate cohomology. And this carries over directly to our setting. The cohomologies of these, of these differential graded algebras can be described in terms of the um, kernel of the associated Laplacian. I guess I haven't told you what this is either, but in fact, the metric that we constructed from this one one fundamental form, uh, with respect to that, these guys here are adjointable. So this is a jointable just in the naive sense, not in the sense that Freddie would have talked about in the unbounded operators. This is on the vector space, this inner product space, the rejointable with respect to the associated inner product, which is to say the metric that we have composed with the higher state that we have coming from the fact that these are compact quantum groups in the sense of our knowledge. Um, good. And that allows us to calculate some of the cohomology. It tells we can calculate, for example, the first cohomology group here is going to be one. That makes sense because classically these things are connected manifolds. So that's what the cohomology would be. We've also got a lot of symmetry given by the star map that we have here. Remember that the, the star map was asked to interact with the complex structure by giving us a symmetry around the vertical form. We've also got an associated Hodge map uh, to, associated to the metric. And that allows us to give symmetry around the horizontal cohomology. So we have all of the symmetry with our cohomologies, which we could represent, for example, if we look at CP2, it's a two-dimensional case, four-dimensional. Um, our cohomology groups inside in this Hodge diamond that we had before, these arrows here indicate isomorphisms. So in particular, we can see here that this guy, remember, was connected. This had dimension one. So we've got this symmetry up here. So it means the top guy has also got dimension one. And in fact, and this has also got to mention one. In fact, Kähler, the Kähler form, this kappa and all powers are going to be harmonic. They're going to be constructed, or by const they're going to be contained inside in the kernel of this map. So the harmonic forms, so they give cohomology, they give representatives of your cohomology. And this non-vanishing cohomology is important. I mean, this is what I'm just saying here. Now this, this Kähler form, it will always live on these 
this uh, central column because it's just one one, so its power is a one one. It means that this is always non-zero because you've always got a power of the Kähler form in there. And that's quite important because if you take cyclic cohomology, which is the replacement usually used in non-commutative geometry, introduced by Kahn and uh, Moscovici, the one that's, sorry, not by Kahn and Moscovici, but by Tegan, Boris Tegan. Um, if you apply this to quantum groups, you get, you get for example, for the Podlesch sphere, you get that your cohomologies, you get that H0 is equal to one, the dimension of H0 is equal to one. This is for OQ of S2. Um, but this is equal to zero. You get this so-called dimension drop for your cyclical homology, which is somehow means that the cyclical homology is missing some of the detail because missing some of the structure of this, that it's not completely suitable. People have discussed ways to vary, to, to fix this by introducing a twist, but that's not so popular with other people. But in this cohomology theory, in the, the cohomology associated to our differential graded algebra, the one that comes naturally from Lustig's PBW construction, we get it for free and we get a, a representative of the cohomology form given by this, the powers of the Kähler form. So everything works as nicely as you would hope for. Um, in addition, we get these things called the Kähler identities. These are classic, these are very famous identities on any Kähler manifold and this carries directly over. What's important about these, well, they're important for many, many reasons, but what's important about them for this talk is that by messing around with some algebraic manipulation of these terms, you end up getting that your Laplacians, these three Laplacians that I have over here, these three Laplacians actually coincide. But what that means is that if the Laplacians coincide, then the kernels of the Laplacians coincide, which means that the corresponding harmonic forms coincide, which means that your cohomologies coincide basically means that you get a refinement of your Duram cohomology by your Dalbo cohomology. So this is with respect to the, the differential graded algebra itself, the one where we haven't taken into account this refinement to an N2 grading. And this one is the one where we do take into account the refinement, this N refinement to an N2 grading. And this is basically taking cohomology along these diagonals. Uh, that's one, there were two actually, I should have Adele and Adele Bar, and the other one is taking it across the other diagonals. And it's saying that if the co and in general for Hermitian manifold, these two cohomologies won't be related in an obvious way. You have to go through this whole theory of spectral sequences in order to take your Duran cohomology and try to refine it in these various steps called pages to go on. But for a Kähler manifold, because of this, they have this Fulicher spectral sequence, as they call it, terminates in the first page. And you have this refinement, which is one of these miracles of Kähler geometry. And in fact, this carries over to the non-commutative setting for any non-commutative Kähler structure. So in particular for these examples that we have for the calculi and the full flags and every other flag that's contained inside of them for the A series, we also get this refinement of the cohomology, which we're very happy about. Um, it's coming to the end, or well, probably gone a little bit over, but um, to go back to the very start when we were talking about gelfin Neimark, C-star algebras, compact quantum groups with Voronovich, and uh, Kahn's theory of spectral triples. How does all of this work? How do these calculators, they've been so well behaved until now, will they actually be as well behaved? Well, this is where all the miracles stop. Things become a bit more difficult, but not, not quite yet. So taking this metric that we've considered, remember we took this fundamental one one form, we constructed from it a metric, it's Q deformation of the Kähler metric on these spaces. We can then compose this with the HAR, which is the same basic classically as integrating over the whole space with respect to the HAR measure. That will give us an inner product. And then we can complete this calculus to a Hilbert space, a genuine Hilbert space, completion of these, this L2, which we denote by L2 for obvious classical reasons. In fact, uh, we also get a Hilbert C star module if you complete it not with respect to the, the metric composed with the HAR, but just with respect to the metric itself. And you land it inside in the pre-Seaster algebra, which will complete to a Seaster algebra, you get a Hilbert module, but that's another day's discussion. Um, and now this Dalbo Dirac operator, as we've defined here, is a densely defined operator on this Hilbert space. Um, what you can ask is if it's closable, and since Freddie spoke about before, and it is actually closable, and that's not such a deep thing. It kind of comes from the fact that it's constructed in this way in a, in a dense space. Moreover, it's essentially self-adjoint. So for any unbounded operator densely defined in a Hilbert space, you have an associated notion of an adjoint defined sort of using the least representation theory um, construction. And then you can ask if 
the domain of that operator, because the domains are tricky when you're in an unbounded setting, if the domain of that unbounded operator coincides with the domain of your original operator, and on that domain, the two operators are actually the same thing, that works for all of these guys. And again, that's once you understand, once you've paid attention in Freddie's lectures, you should be able to prove this. Um, so I'm a poor algebraist, I was able to do this, so it's not that difficult. But what's amazing out of this then is we're going to get a functional calculus, for example, on functional calculus for all of these, these operators, unbounded functional calculus, which is nice. Um, we also then, this is, uh, we also get a faithful star representation on this, which is just going to be multiplication. And the multiplication is going to be their bounded operators on this Hilbert space completion. So then we can extend them up to the whole space. We get these bounded operators on all of these guys. So I guess I'm missing a GLS there, but hope you understand. And it's a star representation. So we're starting to get all of the ingredients here for a, a spectral triple. I guess I didn't write down the definition earlier on. We just said it, but remember it was composed of three things. It was going to be a pre star algebra. It's this guy, a Hilbert space, this guy, a representation of your algebra on the Hilbert space, this guy, and then an unbounded, essentially self-adjoint operator, densely defined, which is this guy. So we've got all of the ingredients for a spectral triple from this. We're actually out too much work, but we now need to show that they satisfy the two conditions that are there. This is on the very lower order, I guess, the topological end of the, the spectral triple definition. So what are they? We need that these commutators are bounded operators, and we need that this guy is a compact operator. So how do we prove this? Well, because these operators, I didn't write it here, but in addition, these operators are all diagonalizable. So you have an eigenbasis, an orthonormal basis of your Hilbert space, and on each element of your orthonormal basis is an eigenvector for your Dirac operator. So actually this condition of the inverse, this is well-defined because this is contained, uh, not contained in the spectrum. Um, this is equivalent to your eigenvalues of the operator going to infinity. And this is really the tough guy to, to work out because what we got to do in the absence of general, more general theory, uh, one that we're still trying to construct, you got to sit down and explicitly calculate the spectrum. And that's tough. And if you remember back to Freddie's talk a few weeks ago, the first one of the term, he was showing how to do this for one specific example. And as we all remember, it was, it's quite tough. Um, so this is one of the stumbling blocks that basically were forced um, to calculate this, but for CPN, we sat down myself and Petter and we did it. So for, for this one, this is going to be the A series flag manifold where the cross is either on the first or the last node of the Newton diagram. And we did it, we calculated the spectrum. The, in this case, for all of this condition here is automatically satisfied for all of the irreducible flag manifolds, all of those ones that I gave in the table with these very specific crosses. This carries over, it's, the proof involves Takeuchi's equivalence, the fact that it's a monoidal equivalent, and that allows us to so on and so forth, but it works quite generally. So we get that one for free for all of these remission, and it's just this one we need to calculate. And for CP1, we did for CPN, we did it, and it works. Now, the question that Branimir asked after Freddie's talk uh, in October was: does the corresponding K homology class of your operator is this going to be zero? Because one of the Besides this reconstruction theorem, and another reason, maybe even a more important reason that people are interested practically in spectral triples is that they give you unbounded representatives of your k-homology uh, group associated to the c star algebra, which is the dual k-homology group to the usual k-theory one that all of the classification people like so much. And the thing is, though, that you could construct one. You can always construct a spectral triple, but then the thing is that you come down and it could actually live inside the zero class, and then it's not particularly interesting. However, we know that um, the index of the operator is going to be the same upstairs or downstairs. So if it goes into the zero class, then the index is going to be zero. But using all of these cohomology results that we had earlier on, these symmetries of the cohomology groups, together with something called the Kodaira vanishing theorem that I proved uh, with Jan Stovicek and Adam Christian von Rusmanen, which I didn't have time to mention, um, taking this, this description of the cohomology, well, identifying the index with the cohomology, which is just the classical proof, and then using the, in the, in the, the identification of the cohomology with the harmonic forms coming from here, we can actually calculate this explicitly, show that the index is one, and then show, and then conclude that in fact, the associated cohomology class of these things is not a zero. But this is just for CPN, which is the first cross of the last, somehow the easiest of all of the A series. Um, and then that's what I was talking with Freddie, was with the B series, together with myself and Elmer, Elmer Wagner in Morelia in Mexico, did it for the first guy in the B series, which is going to be uh, 
this node here, the so-called quantum quadric. And using a different approach to what myself and Petter did because the representation theory was, is more difficult in this example than it was in the previous one, so our approach won't work. Well, using a dualization of the BGG sequence in the, the spectrum was explicitly calculated, it shows that it goes to infinity, hence you get a spectral triple. And again, the same thing going on with the cohomology, you can calculate it and then you know that the corresponding index of the cohomology class is non trivial. Um, but they're just a, a family of examples for CPN together with one in the B series, so there's a lot more to do. Um, so we conjecture, this is a finishing up a very broad conjecture, it says that the A series construction of the cutiform Duran complex extends to a general UQG construction. So we claim that it's not just the A series, everything else works and we hope to do that's one of our next goals is to extend it up. And moreover, that the Dalbo Dirac operator is always going to have compact resolvement. It's not really practical to keep on calculating the spectrum, so we have to develop some sort of new machinery in particular, we'd like a type of quantum Parthasarathy formula, which is an algebraic result linking the Laplacian together with the Casimir, the central operator inside the UQG. But this is very much work in progress and very early days on this, but we're optimistic that it will hold. But the surprise that we have though at the very end is in fact, ah, I should mention this though as well. In support of this, we did a result that's with Petter um, and Bishrup Das, an older uh, paper from last year, where if we take these operators and we twist them by a negative line model, this is negative in the sense of um, Kähler geometry negative, that the, the curvature of the associated line model will be a negative uh, multiple, purely complex negative multiple of the Kähler form, it doesn't matter so much. Then we actually get a Fredholm operator. So we put a bound on our, um, a lower bound on our spectrum, we get this spectral gap from which we can conclude Fredholm, a much weaker property than the compact resolvent property, but still a strong indication that, or at least an indication, that it does work, but all a very geometric proof here. We didn't actually calculate anything for this for general results using, in fact, these Kähler identities that we had earlier on to help us put a spectral gap on these things and conclude Fred one. So this is kind of an example of the conceptual proof that we would like to go forward with because I, I'm, I'm sick of calculating eigenvectors. Um, but the surprise is that general when you move outside of the uh, Hermitian symmetric outside of the irreducible or the Hermitian symmetric case of flag manifolds your commentators no longer bounded and this does not appear to be a problem with the, the construction that we have it's actually a feature and there were deeper reasons for why this is going on but there is a generalization of spectral triples up to twisted spectral triples and we hope to be able to fit it into this and what you do is you end up twisting your commutator bracket which again is maybe not such a surprise because with all of this PBW basis where everything is coming from this root space construction that you have is actually a Q deformation of the Lie bracket of your corresponding classical Lie algebra. So the fact that these things are going to be twisted is maybe not such a surprise, but it's so all in the future and a lot more to come. So yeah, thank you very much for your attention and sorry for going a bit over. Very nice talk. So uh, does anyone have any uh, questions? Yeah. I have a question. Yeah, go ahead. Okay. I, I don't know if you can see me. I'm, I'm very bad into this. Wait, I don't know. Okay. Um, let me see. Okay. Maybe you can. Right. Sorry. All right. Yeah, yeah, I can see you. Yes. Yeah, sorry about that. I, I just. No problem. All right. So it, it's very nice, everything you said, uh, but you might, at the beginning, you said something very true that if you look at the Dieckenberger called the calculus, that's very technical, right? So it's, when you try, yeah. to, okay, how does it look like? So will you be able to work out some examples like SU3, you know, something that you can really put your hands on, right? And SL2, take SL2 and take the podlash. That I, mean, I know. <laughs> yeah, okay. That I know. Then, then the next step is SL3, sure. Yeah, uh, yeah, I was actually, uh, Ramon, you gave a terrific talk. I really enjoyed it. But I'm giving you back the question that you gave to me when I was giving a talk, which is what beyond SL2 can you really compute? This is a kind of, you know, it's... It I mean, we, we can really sort of take any of the examples here. You can really compute. I mean, if you want to look at what the tangent space is like, for example, uh, they, have, they give a very explicit presentation of the tangent space. So if we look at the tangent space for the full flag of SL3. Yeah, that's very exciting. So how do you do that? Uh, E1. Yeah. E2, E1, E2, Q, plus minus one. The plus minus one, remember we had two choices in the 
decomposition of the longest element of the Voyle group, but basically reduces down to a plus or a minus Q in your commutator. And of course, up here we have F1, I messed this up with F2, and the Q commutator of F1, F2, Q plus minus one. That's exactly what it is. And in fact, if you go to the rest of them, this is really what it looks like. You've just got iterated commutator brackets, iterated Q deformed commutator brackets. And that's what your tangent space is like, and you can write it down explicitly for all SLN. I'm sorry, it's a problem matter of notation. So you take the bracket E1, E2, yep. right? These Q are your, the generators of, of UQSL3, the simple roots. Yes. Then take a commutator bracket with Q to form. So this is just E1, E2 minus Q plus minus one. Oh, right, right, right. I know what that is. No, that's not the problem. The problem is that you write E1 on top and then the other one on bottom. What are I, you? I guess this is suggestive. I'm putting it into a matrix. Ah, okay. So there is no, okay, okay. It, I it's a, yeah, it's I supposed to remind you of the fact that in, inside in the trace three matrices, this is the entry just below the diagonal. This is the other one. And then, of course, you take the commutator right, to get is, the third one. Where is W coming in? You know, when you were doing the Weil group element? Here, you've got a choice whether we take the commutator ah. with plus or minus one. I see. Okay. Same, oh, same up here. Right. Oh, okay. Thank you. Thank you very much. And this, this works for all. So if you just take the usual commutator bracket right. presentation of, of SLN, this carries over directly. And then all of your uh, sub flag manifolds are just going to be subspaces of this. That you can pick out depending on whether you, where you put the levy. Uh, okay. So you can explicitly describe the tangent space. Yeah. Okay, thank you. And this is actually given. So for the special case of the Grassmannians, this is given in. Is it? Uh, maybe not. But anyway, this this is what Heckenberger and Kolb looks like the tangent space explicitly as well. Okay. Thanks for that. Uh, so Ala, you have a question as well. Uh, yeah, so uh, have you tried to see what happens with connections for uh, say line bundles over? Uh, so for the irreducible case, connections, uh, covariant connections, zero one connections exist and they're unique for every line bundle. Moreover, they're flat. So the, uh, just like in the classical case, they're unique. And then you can look at the curvature of the associated NABLA the del plus del bar, and then this will give you a scalar multiple of the corresponding Kähler form, which will be positive for the positive line bundles and negative for the negative line bundles, showing you that they're positive and negative, just like in classical Kähler geometry, which means that these things are actually in the irreducible case, non-commutative Fano manifolds. Okay, so everything carries over. Everything carries over, yeah. And it's, it's, it's but still quantum SU2, adding in that torus, we still don't know how to do it. But the more of this stuff that works out, the more like there has to be some way to fix it. And yeah, just have to wait for the right idea to come at some point. Yeah. Yeah. Hang on. So in the classical setting, with a smooth manifold, can, one can also associate the algebra of polyvector fields with this mm -hmm. in his bracket. Yes. Yes. So you do have this notion of a quantum tangent space over a point. Mm -hmm. So I would naively guess that in the parallelizable case, like for homogeneous spaces, mm -hmm. you can assemble it to some kind of quantum tangent bundle and talk about sections. Mm -hmm. So is there a way to uh, get this dual calculus of polyvector uh, fields? Um, probably, but again, I guess you're talking about commutator brackets. Well, whatever the whatever your notion of a quantum tangent space at a point. It's going to be this, actually. It's the subspace of the Lie algebra, or the subspace of the universal enveloping algebra given by these things, these Lustig group vectors. This is, because I mean, if you take, this is what, the full flag of SL3, this is what the tangent space would be classic. So this is there. Yeah, so we want, we want sections of the tangent bundle. So we want then you're going to take the associated vector bundle to this UQ of L, well, this torus bundle, this torus module. Okay, and then there will be a notion of a bracket for the then this is where it becomes a bit subtle because you're taking you know, brackets and things should be cue deformed in the correct way. So you have to be careful about how this works, but I would guess that it should be possible. So because, yeah, so the case I'm interested in is when you have bivector fields subject to integrate mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. So I was wondering if there is no... Honestly, we haven't thought about it very much, but I would guess since everything else works out, once you find the right way of looking at it, the right way of sort of non quantizing the the definition, then it should work. But yeah, it's just something we haven't really looked at yet because there's been so many other things to do. 
Um, but I mean, it's because I guess the Poisson structure is so closely related to all of these quantizations, it's a very interesting question to ask. And I would certainly be interested in seeing what it looks like once I have time. Okay, great, thank you. Any, uh, any other questions? No one in the, we got a question for the audience? No. Okay, well uh, then I guess I'll pass it over to Karen to introduce next week's talk. You there, Karen? No, Karen? Uh, yeah, sorry, I, I am here. I was just having trouble finding the unmute. Yeah, so next week we are only on Zoom uh, and this will be a talk by Elon Hirschberg. I will talk about mean cohomological independence dimension and the radius of comparison. So hope to uh, see you all next week. Thank you everyone. Bye.